My name is Jeff Johnson, and I am a communication specialist. That was not really the goal for me graduating from high school. It was more like, hey, I'm Jeff Johnson. I'm a superhero. I'm, at the very least, president of the United States. But here I am, a communication specialist helping those in the private sector and government executives figure out ways to develop high-level messages that when targeted strategically at the right demographic move not only market but social impact. That's what I do. And so when I talk about disruption in communication, it's really about how are we communicating in a way that is more effective to bring about impact in all of the areas of our lives. So when we talk about that, what is communication? Communication is really just a process. It's a process by which individuals exchange information uh, using a common set of words, symbols, and even behaviors. But in the world we're living in right now, and in America in particular, we have seemed to embrace a new normal of dysfunctional communication where we are not really exchanging, we're hurling, catapulting in many cases ideas, but not really exchanging. And so it's imperative at this time that we're really in a place where we understand that the biggest, as Shaw would say, problem with communication is the illusion that it's happened. And we have done more talking at this time in our history than ever before with less communicating than ever before. More technology that helps us send out messages with less energy to actually receive information, process it, and return. And so we have entered into a space of a echo chamber where we are, one, organizing with those that believe only what we believe, and then shouting at each other how great what we believe is to have it reverberated all over the place so that ultimately those in that space take it as truth because we have pushed away every dissenting voice because only one voice matters, mine. What this echo chamber kind of communication does for us is it puts us in a place where one, policy is not about how do we have pragmatic policy makers that move towards the development of legislation that benefits the masses. We have just put in, in place um, ideologues who are in a space where they would actually rather see the whole system burn down than they would create relationships that build results for the masses of people that they serve. And I don't care whether you're on the left or the right. We see ideologues that are taking up public space because it seems entertaining to a population that actually is more interested in a leader that says what they want than delivers what they need. Echo chambers put us in places where we are afraid to talk about issues because they're so sensitive and we have gotten so accustomed to only talking to people in our own circles that when it comes time to having a conversation we're only used to pontificating and not listening. How many of you have been in conversations recently where you're watching someone wait to respond as opposed to listening to what it is that you're saying? And social media in many cases doesn't make it better because social media has created a space where we have empowered gangster digital superheroes to leap low intellect in a single bound, uh, taking on all challengers anonymously with few followers. <laughs> but, but what this does is it not only removes humanity from communication, it feeds fear, it feeds cowardice, it fears hate and anger. And it puts us in a situation where we are no longer looking to communicate as much as we're looking to tell you why you're wrong. See, humanity is really about understanding. When we, are, when we see someone's humanity, we are interested in understanding who they are. And not only is this important from a communication standpoint, but it's important because when we have removed the humanity, we now are more interested in being right than being understood, 
and more interested in debate than we are in communication and conversation. You know who understands this better than anybody else? Good husbands. (laughs) Good husbands understand without question that I am no longer for the sake of peace, for the sake of love, for the sake of tenderness. Did I say peace? (laughs) I'm no longer interested in being right at all. My wife's in the back of the room. She will tell you that we have worked tirelessly to be more interested in, do you understand what I'm saying and can I understand you than who was right or not? We we were both inspired uh, by this revolutionary movie called Avatar, uh, where uh, the people, the Navi, when they come across each other, And before they go into communication, they say, I see you. Wow, I see you. How simplistically profound. Because if I see you, there are things I won't say to you if I don't see your humanity. If I see you, there's a way that I will talk to you that I won't talk to you if I'm just yelling at the wall. If I see you, I want to understand what makes you tick, where you come from, why you think the way that you do, versus just telling you why what you think is wrong and where you come from is is off and what you believe is less important than what I believe. I see you. This is important because one of the things that understanding does in communication is it removes fear. And when we talk about our communities in communication, fear is one of the things that is blocking us from moving to spaces, not just politically, but in neighborhoods that are more effective. Probably one of the greatest examples is policing. Um, Policing is one of the most polarizing topics. And if we're honest, we understand that both police and neighbor, neighbor citizens are afraid of each other. They're afraid of each other in many cases because they haven't had conversation. We we had a conversation with some young people that said, what does good policing look like? And a 13-year-old immediately was like, I know, I know, I know, I know. And I I was thrilled, one, uh, because teenage boys very seldom get that excited about anything other than entertainment or sports. Um, I said, said, tell me. He said, I I was watching it on TV with my grandma. Um, I saw him, but I can't remember his name. I'm like, well, tell me about him. I'm like, what cop is this on TV? Uh, He said it was in black and white. I'm I'm like, really? It was in black and white? (laughs) Andy Griffin. I said, you got to explain this to me, youngin. He said, man, listen, he don't even really seem like he a cop. All he do all day is just build with people. So he knows what's a threat and what's not. And this 13 year old watching Andy Griffith with his grandmother could see what data has already showed us. That when you pull police officers out of police cars and have them walking the beat, they talk to more people on the route. They create relationships with people. They understand who in the community is helpful and who in the community is a threat. And then when when crisis comes, They're not as afraid because they've built relationship with the community. Conversation that that feeds on understanding is so much more powerful than conversation that feeds on fear. So Nat Turner said, good communication is the bridge between confusion and clarity. And that is the truth. When we are really communicating, we no longer are confused and hopefully what I don't see very often in this current space, is those that are actually looking to find solutions and answers versus spend so much time talking about why somebody else's won't work. In this political climate, in the midterms in particular, there's so much conversation about the shift in who would control the house and not a whole lot of conversation about what would they do when they control it. I'm so uninterested in your arguing over an ideological position in order to have power versus how do you work together to create a better nation with those you disagree with. See, J.D. Vance wrote a book 
uh, called Hillbilly Elegy. And for those of you that haven't read it, uh, I think it's a brilliant book that chronicles his life growing up in Appalachian, Ohio, uh, as well as, and, and his family grew up in Kentucky. Uh, incredible book in my mind, but as I was reading it, it was talking about a family that was violently loyal to each other, that was dealing with all kinds of issues of undereducation and lack of access to health care, um, a family that all they wanted above all else was to get the next generation to be able to move away from where they currently were. Doesn't really matter where, just out. And they wanted something better, normally through education, for children that were coming up. And as I was reading this, it reminded me of families I know in urban communities all over the country. But here's what's interesting. That's not communicated. Because in the very society we live in, the narrative says that this little girl is drastically different than this young man. That their families want different things. That they don't believe and have the same values. That one should vote for Trump because the other voted for Obama. When the reality is they are more alike than they are alike to Trump or Obama. And if they came together by seeing each other and communicating the power that they could have, real communication puts us in a place where we're no longer confused about who our allies are and who our enemies are. And so what do we do? How do we change this? First, empathy over evaluation. When you see somebody, stop evaluating what's wrong with them, why they are the way they are, why they think the way they think, versus looking to understand. Listen to hear versus just respond. Talk to enlighten. How many times have you ever realized that I'm actually not talking to help anybody understand anything? I'm just talking to get them to believe what I believe. And last but not least, communicate vision and commitment. The best communicators are those not that make you positive that what somebody else wants is wrong. They're those that make you see what currently seems impossible as possible. And they show you their commitment to achieve it not just pontificate on it. Are you prepared to create ecosystem by sharing power? Because that's what communication is. Sharing yourself with each other and someone else sharing with you that in the midst of it, you're building this beautiful ecosystem where you understand that even if I fundamentally disagree with you, we're all a part of the same ecosystem. I can't thrive if you are dying. I can't win if you are losing. The greatest example before I get out of here for this kind of communication. That's my mother, 70, mm. <laughs> and my son in his ones. Here's empathy. Here's I see you. Here's listening to hear. Here is talking to enlighten. Here is giving vision just with a smile. Now, I'm not telling you to go to work and treat anybody like your grandmother or your child. I'm not saying that politicians in some way, shape, or form should be familial more than they should just be focused. What I'm saying is, if we are willing to communicate in a way where we share power together, communicating in a way that we change the narrative from simply you being right and me being wrong, then imagine what we could do together. Thank you.